Good morning. Glad you're here this morning, and, and welcome to Word and Baptist Church. Today is Father's Day, so happy Father's Day to all of you who are here in the congregation with us today or joining us online. We're, we're glad for, I'm thankful for a godly father that I had growing up, but also godly father, I, uh, the godly fathers we have here in this church too. It's great to have some some really uh, super men to, uh, here to do that. And, and along that lines, I want to remind you that uh, each week we send out a, a kind of a family Sunday school lesson scripture. And that is, this week it's, it's John chapter 4, verses 1 through 42. And all these passages have to do with um, encounters with Jesus, people who have uh, face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus. So Take some time if you're a dad, if you're a family, mom or dad, y'all take together some time as a family and read through the scripture, even if it's just you and your wife, y'all read through the scripture together and talk about it and ask those questions like, what does this passage tell us about God? And what does it say about this person that had the encounter with God? And, and, and how are they different because of the time they spent with Jesus? Some things like that. Make some great discussion, do it around the, the, the table at, at dinner or whenever. So do that, Okay. Now, we're here for one purpose today, and that's to worship the Lord, to lift Him up, and to praise Him for His goodness, for His goodness in the middle of storms, in the good times, the bad times, always that the, the God is faithful and good to us. And so we're going to hear that both in the message of song and the message from Scripture as well. So let's just join Him and praise Him today. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control, and in the middle of a war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When the solid ground has fallen now from underneath my feet, between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. And when I realize I've been sold out by my friends and my family, I can feel the rain reminding me in the eye of the storm. When 
you forget to ask anybody to pray, you come back up here and pray. So we're going to spend a little time in prayer. I do want to remind you of our prayer things for this week, our prayer people for this week. Uh, Lynn Bells, our member of the week, trying to get that farming finished, needs some rain, so y'all pray for him and all the farmers. Ethan Moore is our youth of the week. And Arabella Pedigo family, the little young lady that died tragically here in our community this week, we definitely want to remember their family in prayers this week. And so lift them up to the Lord and uh, uh, spend some time in prayer. Let's pray for them right now and, and for this service. Lord, I thank you for the day today, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, thank you for the, the meaning of today, the Father's Day in, in my own life, for the great dad that you've given me, a great heritage of of dad, granddad, and so on that, that you've given to me, and, and the, the wonderful opportunity you've given me to be uh, a dad as well, and for my kids and grandkids, and I pray that uh, we would all be faithful to follow you throughout our lives. Lord, take, um, uh, I pray for Lynn and for Ethan, and give them a special week, and for all of our farmers, give them the, the rain they need this week, and get, get their fields all planted. Uh, I pray for this family and this tragic loss here in our community this week that just it just breaks our heart, and I pray that, that through this, that you would provide comfort to this family and that they would see you in, a, in an experience you in a very special way and know that you are there in the eye of the storm of their life, that you are there and that you are still good to them and that you love them so much. Lord, help us to know that. Help us to understand that. Help us to live this out this week. I ask these things in your name, and I praise you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand again.
seated. Nobody but Dave is here. All right. Glad you're here this week. Hope you've had a, a great week. Glad to see, see you here and um, with us this morning. So after last week, we got a little introduction. So this week, we're going to jump into our um, study of uh, our new series study of the life of Joseph. We call living the dream. So what do you think of when you hear the word dream or dreams? Okay. Uh, the dictionary kind of gives basically two meanings, which really aren't similar at all, really. Uh, the two definitions are this. One is uh, the defines dreams as hopes, uh, plans, ap aspirations, a purpose in your life, okay? You've all used the word dream that way. What are, you, what are your dreams for the future and so on? And also, it also defines it as thoughts, images, sensations that we experience or that occur during sleep. You've all experienced those. Maybe you had some of those last night. And they're really two different things. In C.S. Lewis's um, novel, uh, the, the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, the, the main characters in the book are on a voyage, and on, along the way, they, they uh, rescue a man from an island. And he gets off the island, and they pull him on board the ship, and he's nearly gone crazy from his time on this island. And they, they ask him, well, what's so terrible about this island? And he says, this is the island where dreams come true. Now, when they hear that, several of the sailors are ready to dive in and swim to the island immediately. They've been looking for this island. He goes, no, no, no. Not dreams definition number one, not your hopes and your aspirations and, and all of that comes true. No, it's those nighttime, crazy nighttime dreams that we have that's on that island. So think about living on an island where all you experience are those things, you know, where you're running somewhere and hurrying to get there and you just can't get there. You had those dreams, you know? Or um, I've had this one a lot. I've been a student too much of my life. You, you show up at school and you realize it's the last day of the semester and that you missed all the other classes and everything's due in the test that day and you haven't been there all along. Anybody had that one? I've had that several times. The other night, I had a weird dream about, I don't know where exactly I was, but every room and place I walked in, there was these like huge snakes there. And as we look at Joseph and all this, I don't know if there's any message behind that or anything, but uh, so, so there's a difference between the two. So if we're talking about Joseph living the dream, which one are we talking about here? In a sense, a little of both, um, because dreams definitely do play a major part in the story of Joseph. And yes, God seems to speak through nighttime dreams, through dreams that way to Joseph to show his mess, uh, to give him his message. Not necessarily those crazy things, though, but to show messages to him. But really, and more than anything, the story of Joseph is about God's dream, God's vision, God's purpose for this man, Joseph. And as we see, as we go through every week, we'll, we'll hit on this over and over again. It's not just the plan and the purpose of the life of this man, Joseph, but also his father, Jacob, also his brothers, also the people of, of, of the nation of Israel, the nation of Egypt. And as we're going to see through all this study, even coming down to us, there's an impact that comes from this man's life and what happens. So God has, has a dream for mankind that acts, is acted out through the life of Joseph. And so we're going to look at that and, and, um, and, and see that. Today we're going to start with, with one of the most famous parts of the story of Joseph, and that's the part about his technicolor dream coat. Okay? Andrew Lloyd Webber wrote a musical about that several years back, and, and even though I'm a big, truly a big Broadway musical fan, I've seen a lot of them, I haven't seen that one. And I'm not sure what the musical's message is, but I do know what, the one really counts, what the scripture's message is. And the scripture's message is this, it, it, it shows a man and how God has a plan for that man and those around him and beyond him around their life. And so let's look at that in the life of Joseph and see how this, this coat fits into the story. And there's two main things I want us to see today about God's will, God's plan, God's purpose in our lives. And this is the first part, might want to write this note down, 
and that is that God works through our weaknesses. We're going to see God working through weaknesses in a big way here in this. And that, you could take the word weaknesses and you could um, substitute uh, several other words. You could say God works through our faults, through our mistakes, even through our sins. God's purpose is not thrown off the rails because of our mistakes and those things. God is still able to work through them. We're going to start by going to Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to read the, just the first four verses to start with. See him, see if you can find some example of weaknesses, faults, sins, problems, and so on, that just in the first four verses, okay? Genesis chapter 37, beginning in verse 1. It says, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. These are the family records of Jacob. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bila and Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, and he made a robe of many colors for him. When his brothers saw that his father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peacefully peaceably to him. All right, do, do you see some major weaknesses, some major difficulties and problems here in the characters just in these four verses? Let's take a look at some of those, and just in case you didn't see them. Uh, how about, let's start with Jacob. Let's start with Jacob's what? Favoritism. That's a problem, isn't it? Yeah, Jacob's favoritism is truly a problem. It starts in verse 3 by saying very plainly, now Israel, which another name for Jacob, okay, now, Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons, plain and simple. No question about it. Doesn't say, hey, there's a little question here. It just says he loves him best, okay? Now, you'd think Jacob wouldn't do that because Jacob grew in, up in an environment, as we saw last week in, in our introduction part, grew up in that kind of environment where he was his mother's favorite, but his brother was his father's favorite and the difficulties that brought. And you would have thought Jacob would have learned enough lessons not to bring this in to his own children in his own family situation, but he did that anyway, apparently. And it created great hatred between his older sons and their brother Joseph. Uh, it says that they could not, they couldn't stand to be around him. They could not stand to talk peaceably to him. They didn't want to talk to him. They didn't want to see him. They don't have anything to do with this brother. Interestingly enough, in the midst of all this favoritism, Jacob kind of does the classic number one thing you could do if you want to make sure you alienate all your other sons and show one his favorite, is bring him this fancy, nice, multicolored coat. Now, scholars say that the, the translation, many colors, is kind of questionable with if that's all that it means. It's just not just a coat that was nice and colorful. It gives more of an idea that the coat was uh, very ornate, uh, very decorated. Uh, some say maybe the best translation is, is that it was a long-sleeved coat, maybe a long coat to the ankles, to the sleeve. Now think about that. Jacob and his sons are shepherds. What shepherd needs a nice, ornate, mink coat kind of thing, right? Some with long sleeves. and you're gonna, Who needs that? So when Jacob gives Joseph this coat, he's sending a message. It would be, and I, I hope Brian doesn't mind me using him. Brian's a farmer like Jacob and has lots of sons like Jacob, so it, it fits here, okay? So it'd be like Brian buying all of his boys uh, farm clothes. Boys, I'm going to give you some boots and some overalls, some jeans, whatever you need. These are work clothes, except for one of the boys, I'll let the boys figure out who this would be. But one of the boys, he gives a tuxedo to. It's pretty plain and clear. You boys are expected to work. You are expected to live the high life, right? And that's what it was with Joseph and his brothers. And on top of the way they're already being treated, the dad gives this coat and it just uh, explodes. One other thing that scholars think also, that it could also mean that this was... Jacob's way of showing Joseph that he was the favored son by giving him the double inheritance that normally goes to the oldest son. If you 
know the story of the, the parable in the New Testament Jesus tells about the prodigal son. When the son returned home, we always talk about dad went and killed the fatted calf, but he also brought and put a ring on his finger and a robe on him. And some think that robe was, you're back in your favored place you were before. That's why the other brother got so jealous and all. So maybe this was not, it was more than just, I like you best. I like you best. I'm going to honor you best. You're not going to have to work as hard as all your other brothers. And when it comes down to it and I'm gone, you're going to get double what everybody else gets. So you could imagine why his brothers would have not been very, looked very favorably onto their brother Joseph. But in spite of Jacob's favoritism and weaknesses, the covenant that we saw last week that God made with Abraham, passed on to his son Isaac and then to Jacob, it still stands. God is not saying, with well, Jacob, what a lousy dad you are. You're out, I'll find somebody else. God is still faithful. He's still true to his purpose. Even in spite of Jacob's favoritism, and as we see this whole story develop, even through it, God is going to use his favoritism, even as bad as it was, to work out his plan. Here's the second thing I notice in here, and that's Joseph's pride. Now, there are some uh, commentators that I read that, that are uh, kind of questionable on this one. I kind of 50 50 on this one. Um, some, I, I heard one commentator said there are th only three characters in Scripture that are pretty much portrayed as perfect. They're not saying Joseph was perfect. They said there's no record of overt sin in their lives. It was Joseph, Daniel, and Jesus. Now, Jesus, of course, was perfect. Then the writer was not saying that Joseph and Daniel uh, were perfect. It's just their sins are not recorded for all to see. Uh, so others are going, ah, I don't know. And, and as I look at it, I, I see some pride in Joseph here. I see an element of pride. I see an element of self-focus and self-centeredness in his early days here. I mean, you could understand why that would develop in him, right? When you're the favorite all the time and, and uh, you're spoiled and sheltered, you can understand why he might have some pride and kind of self-centeredness and looking down on his brothers a little bit. You could see that happening. If, if, if it didn't go that far, at least living that kind of spoiled, sheltered life is going to leave you to be at least immature more and maybe a little naive in some things, maybe. So whether it's pride or whether it's immaturity, we see Joseph's behavior escalating the problem with his brothers. Dad's done everything to fan the flames, but here comes Joseph, and we see him with maybe some immaturity or pride that, that adds to it here. Uh, one of the things we've already read, and, and a second one we'll, we'll add here in just a second, but did you notice he, the story about his brothers, reporting his brothers? He did go out and do some work. He went out and spent some time with his brothers out in the fields. When they came in, it says that Joseph reported, gave dad a bad report on his brothers. Uh, the word, the Hebrew word there, a report, every time it's used in Scripture, is used in a negative light. A negative as in the person giving it was doing it for either being dishonest about it or, or slandering somebody with that report or hurting, harming somebody in that way. So I see Joseph as being a little guilty here of uh, whether he came in and, and not necessarily that he lied about his brothers. As we notice, the way these boys are, getting a bad report is pretty probably common for them. Uh, but he didn't have to lie, but maybe he painted the picture so that they looked worse and he looked better. Maybe it was the motive behind it that I'd like to get my brothers in trouble because they're so mean to me or something like that. But I see some pride in Joseph here as he does that. At the very least, he comes across as a tattletale and a snitch, right, on his, on his brothers. That. Now, a, a, a writer by the name of R.T. Kendall gave a perspective I hadn't thought of. And he said this. He said, when God shows things to us, reveals things to us, particularly about his will and his plan and his call into our lives, he says, our first conclusion tends to be, oh, wow, thank you for doing this for me. It tends to be our first thoughts are about how what God is doing, his plan is for me. He says a good example is the disciples. Jesus called them, and they left everything to come follow him. 
But they didn't come, let's, let's face it, in the beginning, they didn't come following him going, what can we do for you, Lord? How can we bring you glory? They followed him, and what did they talk about? Who's going to be greatest? Who's going to sit next to Jesus? And when is the kingdom coming so we can be part of the kingdom? It was a lot of selfishness involved in that. And, and Kendall reminds us that a lot of times when God reveals his will to us, in our hasty conclusion, we think he, God is doing this for our sake. And he says this, that God has to bring us to the place where we see it's for his glory and his purpose. And you see when the, that connects with the disciples, don't you? We see how they turn the world upside down when they get off of what is this call and all this purpose have to do with me, and they see what purpose it has for the glory of God. You can see that. And so what Kendall is saying in Joseph's life, it's the same thing. Early on here, he's struggling with this self-centeredness, this self-focusedness, even as he sees God has got great things planned for him. It's, look what God's going to do with me and for me and all that. He says, Joseph has to take him through some things, and that's what we'll be looking at in the next several weeks here what God has to take them through. So in the end, you don't see that pride there. You see humility in Joseph and see what an incredible thing he does when he starts living for the purpose of God and not for himself. Okay? I thought that was, a, that, that brought some light to me. I thought that was a, a good point. I like that. But in spite of Jacob's um, favoritism, in spite of Joseph's pride, God's plan doesn't get off track. Did you notice any other problems, weaknesses, anything else in that story? How about the brother's jealousy, right? We see the brother's jealousy. That's pretty obvious there. It says in one verse that, um, oh, oh, hold it, time out. I left something out, okay? Let's back up a moment. <laughs> Before we go on to the jealousy, I got to bring one more thing out. Uh, Joseph did something else to aggravate his brothers. I left out the most big, big deal, okay? Let's go to chat, uh, verse 5. I'm sure back on the screen, they're going, hold it. He left out a whole bunch of verses here. What did, what did Joseph do? He tells about a couple of dreams that the Lord gives him. All right, verse 5. Then Joseph had a dream, and we told it to his brothers. They hated him even more. And he said to them, listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheaves of grain in the field. And suddenly, my sheaf stood up, and your sheaves gathered around it, and bowed down to my sheep. Are you really going to reign over us? His brothers asked him. Are you really going to rule us? And so they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and told this to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and 11 stars, 11 being the number of brothers there, were bowing down to him, uh, to me. And he told his father and brothers, and his father rebuked him. What kind of dream is this that you have had, he said. Am I and your mother and your brothers really going to come and bow down to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the manner in mind. Right. So I forgot to mention that part uh, of uh, Joseph as well. Again, one of those things where maybe here's Joseph being revealed the truth, but maybe he should have done like his father kind of did there. He says, just keep it in his mind and not go share it with the brothers right, right at this point. So that adds fuel to the flame, and we go now to the brothers' jealousy. And what did it say about their jealousy? It said plain and simple, they hated him. They hated him, and then he comes and tells these dreams, and it says they hated him more, and then after that it says they hated him even more. You remember a few weeks ago we talked about in the Hebrew, for the superlative, repeating something three times means, you know, take it, holy, 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 remember that? So it says they hated him, they hated him even more, they hated him even more than that. So they had the highest amount of hate that you could come for someone. These brothers did. They were jealous. Here's a, a good definition of jealousy. Jealousy is being consumed with resentment towards someone because he or she has what I think I need for life and happiness. Now, this can be a perceived advantage. Sometimes it's true. Sometimes it's not. Somebody, sometimes somebody does have an advantage over you. Sometimes someone does have some things that you might like or might need for for some success and happiness in your own life, but it doesn't matter whether it's real or not. Jealousy, or if the, if the reason behind it is real or not, jealousy is destructive. I, I, Laurie, I told you, is, is studying through a book, and she's a little ahead in the story, and so I said, let me read through this book a little bit and, and get some ideas maybe, and it, there's places for writing uh, comments and answering questions, and 
I noticed one of her comments that she said about um, jealousy. She says, jealousy reveals the ugly in our heart. I thought that was a good comment. Yeah. The, the, the author of the series goes on and after that and says, I don't know what jealousy looks like on you, but it doesn't look very good on me. None of us look good in green. You got that one? Green envy. I just want to make sure. For those of you wearing green, I'm not, no, no. Okay. Uh, we don't look good in envy, do we? You want to know how ugly jealousy can be? Uh, let's just look at the story of Jacob and Joseph and his family. Look at verse 30, chapter 37. Go down to verse 18. Dad sends Joseph on a mission. Go check on your brothers. They're out keeping the sheep. Notice Joseph's back at home wearing the nice coat. You go out and check on him. This is what happens when he goes to find his brothers. Verse 18. They saw him in the distance, and before he had reached them, they plotted to kill him. They said to one another, oh, look, here comes that dream expert. So now, come on, let's kill him and throw him into one of the pits. We can say that a vicious animal hit, ate him, and then we'll see what becomes of his dream. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him from them, and he said, uh, let's not take his life. And Reuben also said to them, don't shed blood, throw him into this pit in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him, intending to rescue him from them and return him to his father. And when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped off Joseph's robe, the robe of many colors that he had on, and they took him and threw him in the pit, and the pit was empty without water. And they sat down to eat a meal, and when they had looked up, there was a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were carrying aromatic gum, balsam, and resin going down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what do we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come on, let, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay a hand on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. And when the Midianite traders passed by, his brothers pulled Joseph out of the pit and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Israelites who took Joseph to Egypt. So, you want to see some jealousy? You want to see how ugly it is? They see their brother, and they really contemplate, let's kill him. They were, even though they didn't kill him, they were ready to. They were, most of them were willing to. Yeah, let's kill our brother. That's pretty ugly jealousy, is it not? So, they, they get, think more of it, and, and they become very good-natured, don't they? They just sell him into slavery. Slavery in those days and in that situation would probably a death sentence. They didn't know what was going to happen to him. They just got rid of him. That shows how ugly their jealousy and how ugly jealousy can be. But the ugliness doesn't stop there. Let's go to verse 31. They return home. It says, so they took Joseph's robe, slaughtered a male goat, and dipped the robe in its blood. They sent the robe of many colors to their father and said, we found this. Examine it. Is this your son's robe or not? His father recognized it. It is my son's robe, he said. A vicious animal has devoured him. Joseph has been all torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes and put sackcloth around his waist and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. No, he said, I will go down to Sheol, the place of the dead. I will go to death to my son mourning his father wept for him. So not only were they willing to kill their, son, uh, their brother, they were willing to break their father's heart. They were willing to make their father, who they knew had put all of his love and everything into Joseph, they knew what this would do to him. They knew that it would almost kill him. They were willing to do that and go through that because of the jealousy. Jealousy is definitely ugly, is it not, in all of us. So here's the thing. We see that in spite of, of extreme uh, favoritism that Joseph showed, in, si uh, in spite of some pride that uh, uh, Jacob showed, in spite of some pride that Joseph showed, and in spite of this terrible jealousy between the brothers, God's plan is still very much on track to bring the gospel to you and me. You see, God is able to work through our weaknesses. But God is also able to work through revelation as well, as we can see in this passage. You see, when God has a plan and a purpose for our life, he reveals that plan and purpose. He doesn't make it a secret. He doesn't say, oh, I've got great plans for you. 
that I'm not going to show them to you. He does reveal. Now, that's, he doesn't rarely, if ever, reveals them all at one whack. He doesn't come and says, okay, now you've reached a certain age, you're able to hand it, handle it, so here's all I've got planned for you in your life and everything. He doesn't do that way. He reveals it one step at a time, uh, one chapter at a time, one episode at a time, uh, whatever how, uh, you want to uh, express it in, in a picture. He, he does it one point at a time. And he's great, one episode at a time, like a TV series, you know. And he's great with cliffhangers at the end of the episodes, isn't he, in your life, it seems like. Uh, I, I thought of a, a movie recently, um, and I'll, I'll do my best to do this without giving away the movie. If, you, if you've seen it, any of you seen The Sixth Sense? Okay? If you've seen The Sixth Sense, you know that when you get toward the end of the movie, something is revealed about one of the main characters of the movie. And something that catches you by surprise. I don't want to say anything because it kind of ruins the movie if you already know what's going to happen. It catches you by surprise, and you go, oh, I didn't see that. And then it takes, the movie then takes you back to the past and shows you various things that you've already seen. But this time, now that you know this, you look at these things and you see them totally differently. You go, oh, yeah, why didn't I see that before? Of course. Is that not the way God works with Joseph? You're going to see this all through Joseph's story. But is that not the way he works in our lives as well? Can, can you not do that in your own life of times where now that you look back, you go, oh, yes, he was revealing things all along. Either I was too stupid to see it, too blind to see it, or just, you know, it was just, I, did, I couldn't put it all together till now. That's the way God works. He is, works through his revelation. It may be bit by bit, but he is revealing to us over and over, time after time, day after day, what his will is and purpose is in our lives. Now, he does it in a variety of ways. Sometimes he does it through circumstances. Uh, sometimes he does it through, through feelings and burdens and desires that he gives us. Sometimes maybe uh, words that someone speaks to us, and words of wisdom or advice or uh, something we may hear from others. I think primarily today he speaks through his word, through the scripture to get us, to, to, to show us his will and where he's taken us in, his, in, in our lives. In Joseph's situation, and a rare situation at that, we don't see tons of this happening even in biblical days, but in, through, in Joseph's situation, he uses many times to speak through dreams. Okay? You got to remember, Joseph didn't have scripture available to him at that point in time, so... Uh, God speaks to him through dreams. But through all of this, God is piece by piece revealing to Joseph and to Jacob and to the whole family and to those around and for us to see today that God's plan is at work. Now, his plan and what you see, the, the part of it that you see and understand might be disturbing, might be insulting. I mean, we're going to bow down to you and all that. You know, it might, may not make sense to us, may not be something we like, but it is necessary, as we're going to see as we lay all this out, for God to get his plan in working and to where redemption is available for all of us because of all that has happened. Now, a lot of people, when they're studying narratives in the Bible, like to ask this question. Well, in the story, who am I? Okay. All right, let's take a moment and... I'm going to comment on that question here, but let, let's look at that question for a moment. Who am I, okay? A, a, am, I, uh, am I the brothers? Are you? Are you the brothers? Are you dealing with uh, uh, jealousy in your life, resentment? Are you, do you resent God's plan for your life? Do you resent that that person over there looks like God's got a better plan for them than they got for me, than he's got for me? Is your jealousy more focused toward God, maybe even than the other person? Do you resent it that uh, somebody else looks like they got a better plan going for their life? Is there a particular purpose, uh, excuse me, a particular person, a particular group, or is it just mankind in general that you're just kind of jealous of because it seems like everybody's got a better plan and a better purpose and a better something going on in their life? Um, they got what I want. They got what I need. Are you even? And I, I, I know you're not going to be shaking your head on this one. But are you sometimes, and even struggling with right now, if someone uh, failed, it wouldn't hurt you too bad to watch them fail. 
you know? <laughs> they kind of deserve to fail. <laughs> That's what they get, you know? Do you ever thought that before? Y'all not going to shake your heads yes, right? I am. You know what we preachers do? We love to see other churches fail sometimes. Now, we don't go out and do that all day. But sometimes in the back of our minds, sometimes, you know, overall, I love to see all the churches succeed. But there are times you go, oh, man, I'm as good a pastor as he is. I think I'm even better pastor than he is. Huh. Oh, they lost people. I knew it would. You know what kind of guy he is. You know, there's all kinds of reasons. I'm honest, are y'all? <laughs> we do that, don't we? Do we get caught up in that? Do we, call, do we get caught up in that? Do we get caught up in, in um, uh, we wouldn't mind seeing somebody fail? They didn't mind seeing somebody hurt. They didn't even mind seeing somebody killed. Hopefully we won't go that far, but do we deal with those kind of things? Are we the brothers? You got to remember through it all, God's at work. You don't see it all. So watch your jealousy. What about, are you Jacob? Are you dealing with favoritism and prejudices where you look down other people because they're different or because they're uh, they're not as good as you you think or uh because they don't you know i'm gonna pick to love some people who can return the love back to me what they can give back to me those kind of things you're dealing with those kind of things uh, how about joseph where he kind of was just struggling with it was all about him right and struggling with that pride and those kind of things come let me tell you are you the brothers? Are you Joseph? Are you uh, Jacob? Let me, I can answer the question for you. You know what the answer is? The answer is yes. You are, aren't you? Maybe not at this exact moment. Maybe you deal with a little better. Another, but in some way or another, we all struggle with those things, don't we? At one time or another in our life. We all struggle with these things. And here's the thing why this is really not the best question you ask yourself when you're studying narratives or Bible stories. This is not the best question to ask. Who am I in the story? Because you're everybody. They're, these are sinful people, and you're going to find yourself in all of this, okay? So uh, let me tell you something else about all these people. They're just like us because every one of them needed salvation, didn't they? They need saving. And I don't mean just saving from their sin. They're going to need, if, if y'all are familiar with the story, you already know this. If you're not, they're going to need saving, right? They don't realize it right now but they're going to be saved by the very one that they try to kill, right? Oh, saved by the very one they tried to kill. You see, a lot of people say that Joseph is, along with others, uh, characters in the Old Testament, their lives, they're like a type or a picture of Jesus in many ways. And you will see this, and we'll point this out several times throughout the study of, of the life of Joseph, but he, he's like a type of Christ. It's like before Christ came, God was throwing little hints, little pictures out here of what he was going to be like when he came. You see, Joseph became a victim of his brother's jealousy and cruelty, right? Just like Jesus came into the world and mankind did not accept him because they were of their jealousy. Those religious leaders were jealous of, look how many people are following him now. Look what trouble he made. Uh, he was... He became a victim of their jealousy and their cruelty, right? And though they were unjust, and though they betrayed him, though Joseph's brothers were unjust and they betrayed him, he ends up saving their lives through their unjustness and their cruelty to him. Because they sell him into slavery, he's able to save their lives. Is that not what Jesus did? Because mankind... Through mankind's cruelty and rejection of Jesus, they put him on a cross, and on that cross, he provided salvation for the very ones who put him there. Right? Pretty cool, huh? You see, the real question is not, who am I? The real question is this. When you study Scripture, who is God? That's what you need to ask. This is a book about God. Who is God? So who is God in all this? He is sovereign. He is all-knowing. He is all-powerful. We see these things in this scripture. In this story, we see all of that. We see that God, the all-sovereign God, has a dream, a plan, a purpose for our life. And not only does he have a plan and a purpose, he's got the wisdom to see that purpose all the way and see it all and not be caught off guard by anything. And he has the power to carry it through all the way, does he not? God has a higher, higher purpose 
set in motion. And though we may not understand it, and sometimes we don't see it, we don't understand it, we don't feel God working, it doesn't matter whether we do or not. He is working and working through even our weaknesses, through everything. He's revealing to us step by step who he's doing and what he's doing for us. You see, God has a technicolor dream coat for all of us. He's got a dream, a plan, and a purpose for each and every one of us. And that plan and purpose is so set that God was willing to die for us to make it come true. He gave his life so that that plan for our life could come true. God has a plan for you. You may not understand it. It may include situations and people that you don't like, but all of it, he's leading you to a place of victory in the end, a place in prosperity, a place that's right and perfect. So God has a plan for your life. He died for you so that, that you might know him. Do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know him in a personal way? Are you following him and being obedient to him? Are you being faithful, even in a, maybe a tough time, like, like we're going through some tough times in our, in our nation, in our community, in our lives, personally and together? Can we see God's purpose? Maybe we can, maybe we can't. But do you think God's got a purpose? Oh, yes, he does. Does he have a plan? Yes, he does. Is his plan on track? You better believe it is. Okay? Are you ready to trust him today? Are you ready to trust him with your life by all? Letting him be your savior. Are you ready to trust him by walking daily with him through the difficulties of daily life? Turn these things over to him. And if there's anything that you want to talk to me about, that we can pray about together in your life, in, in trying to find what God's plan is for you and, and how you can be strong, you know you can always contact me, come see me, talk to me after the service here. I'm always available, right? Let's pray. Father, Lord, we come to you because... This story reminds us how awesome, how, what a sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing, all wonderful God that you are. But it also reveals to us just how much we need you. So, Lord, Lord as we close out this service today, uh, will you reveal to us and help us to see just how much we need you. And so that we will come humbly to you. Submitting to your plan, knowing it's the best plan. Giving our lives to you. I pray that if there's someone hearing today that, that doesn't know you as their Savior, that today they'd realize, man, I, I need that Savior. I need that Savior. I need saving from my sin. And I pray that those of us who know you, that we'll, we'll look to you and not um, stay on course. And not look and, and be jealous of others and, and feel look down on others and uh, centered on ourselves because we think we know what's best and what the best plan is, but look to you for your plan and purpose. Lord, we need you, and we come to you and offer ourselves to you this morning. I ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Would you stand with me today?
thanks for being here today. Appreciate you coming. Remember, tonight is Ladies' Night uh, at for our Sunday school time at 5.30 here, covering lessons three and four in your Sunday school quarterly this week. So ladies, be here at 5.30 for that. Uh, remember your your scriptures as a family to read through this week and uh, share Christ with somebody. Have a great week. Thank you for being here. Happy Father's Day. I got to have some of my kids here today. They're on their way to a baseball game. If you wonder why they're dressed the way they're dressed. <laughs> Thanks for coming. What's up, Kurt? <laughs>